to me, it's infinitely more interesting than the first one, where she gets blamed for the killings, where every single killing becomes assigned to some human. I will say, I did kind of like the lead. If for absolutely no other reason, I respect someone who generally tries to help young people. I wasn't entirely clear on, was that like a problem child class? I mean, all th we saw them do was paint. So I guess that that was to help them with their emotional problems, you know, that they're maybe not ready to receive regular... Did she really think that they wouldn't believe in the Candyman myth? And sadly, that takes us to Day of the Dead. The film sets the tone quite appropriately by opening with the hot chick, who apparently really can't stand dripping faucets. Ah, but she wakes up and reveals that, just like the rest of us, hot chicks dream about half-naked hot chicks. Maybe you recognize her. She was on Baywatch, she was a playmate. That's actually her entire career right there. It doesn't take the audience very long to realize that she can't act. She can look good, she can scream, and that's why they cast her. Same for the friend. Same for most of the women in this film. To look good, to wear revealing clothes, to scream. We once again get flashbacks to stuff we already know happened, and this time they use it to add some, to add some more raunchiness to because, you know, it was severely lacking in that department. Why do we need to see Daniel in bed with the woman he painted, and a painting showing her ass? I get that it's supposed to tell us viewers they really cared about each other, Okay, A, we already knew that, and B, then show them in an intimate scene, not just a sexual one. The flashback doesn't tell me they really care deeply for each other, it tells me they bumped uglies before he got whacked. You know, good actors could show the affection through just a look in their eyes, and Tony Todd is a good actor. Then we have the increasingly silly deaths of the mother character, I mean, did anybody else almost crack up when she's standing there smiling, gets her throat slit, still smiling? And when I bring that up, I have to address something. This is the blonde little girl from the first movie, and apparently her age has increased, her acting ability has not. However, let's just say she's 20 in this. Either the first two movies took place 20 years before they were made, or this particular movie takes place nine years from now. Don't be scared by all the futuristic technology you see in the film. If he wants her to join him, why does he keep showing her creepy ass shit? It's like, come join me, now look at your mother with her throat slit. Um, mixed messages there. So the nothing of a plot moves at a snail's pace so that a handful of people can die here and there. She meets and sort of befriends the actor who flips the fuck out on her for, you know, telling the truth to the cops. Seriously, he's blaming her for him taking a rather questionable acting job because he's sure that Brad Bellick, the only actor in this fucking film, other than Todd, might turn it into a vendetta against him. We find out he has a small girl whose acting is god awful, and I guess we're supposed to care about him because he has a girl. So he takes the lead character to his grandmother, and although she at first doesn't think it's a good idea, the grandmother claps, which makes everything okay. After he interprets at first, she suddenly gains the ability to speak perfect English, and she uses her command of the language to tell us almost nothing we haven't already heard. Yes, she's being haunted by something, we knew that. To destroy the evil, you have to destroy the good. What the fuck does that even mean? In this movie, anyway? How exactly does she destroy the good? What, by tearing up his picture because he's fucking Dorian Gray now? So the lead and the actor bond over drinking booze and then sleep together because, hey, they've known each other for about 20 minutes of screen time and it's not like the first time he met her he scared the crap out of her. Ah, wait, no, it's only a dream. 
in which she gets fondled by her great great something grandfather. Ew. Your poppy is where your acting ability is. Gone. How about the part where the lead hears the friend screaming and then it turns out it's because she was rehearsing for a horror movie. Yeah, because people do that, you know, they stand in the middle of their apartment screaming their head off. I don't know, maybe she just read the script for this movie. The entire paper napkin of it. There's no way the lead could disappear into the crowd like that. She's not wearing costume. She's standing out like a sore thumb. Every character in this is obnoxious. The cult of Candyman is beyond stupid. What the fuck were they expecting to gain from saying his name five times? All it adds is another couple of dead bodies to, the, to this movie. How about the friend, the art gallery dude's death? For one thing, the obvious CGI on the bees breaking in through the window. Did I seriously just say the sentence, bees breaking in through the window? Shoot me now. Oh my god, bees. And then in a single cut, two bees become, you know, I don't know, hundreds. And that bit was purely so they could get another woman to undress for the film. How about the ending where Bellig is shot? I'm sorry, it did not look like the guy could have shot him from where he was standing. After the gunshot, he walks out from behind something. How did he make that shot? Did the director seriously think that was an effective reveal? So saying that it was a human being who did all the stuff, in spite of the fact that there's almost definitely not even circumstantial evidence to claim that he did all of the killings, is supposed to make the myth go away. Yeah, cause that worked really well in the first movie. How about her last dream sequence? Who the fuck falls asleep at a cemetery? Well, other than the goth chick in Blair Witch 2. The movie's 85 minutes long, and it's 85 minutes too long. Quite frankly, as was the case with the recent remake of the Runner Classic, it is simply not the dead's day. This barely even uses the Day of the Dead thing. At least the second one used the Mardi Gras a little bit. Anyway, that's Candyman 2 and 3. Hope you enjoyed it.